Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Infants and toddlers bring on lots of fun games for parents and grandparents. You know, the ones where you bounce them on the knee. Actually, bouncing children on the knee with little rhymes, I know and remember them more in German than I do in English because all the bouncing of my children that I did on my knee was in German. Although I had the English ones exposed to me, I don't remember them anymore. And when you think of those different sorts of games that you play with infants and toddlers, ones that always, one that always comes to mind is peekaboo. Peek I know you've played it both as a recipient and as a purveyor of closing your face and being gone and opening your face and being there. It's interesting that this is such a across all human being sort of activity because psychologists tell us that this is a very important part of the development of the brain of a child. They're being taught something that there's a difference basically between <coughs> subjective per perception, everything that I see in front of me is all that exists, and objective permanence. That is, even though I don't see something, it can still be there. And the whole peekaboo process teaches that. As we get older, we learn it in different ways. That is, once you've come to the point of realizing things are there even if you don't see them, you still don't have a full concept of time. Anyone who has pulled their leg away from a screaming toddler at a preschool knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> they don't know that what later is. They only know that you're leaving. So they're making it, it takes time for them to learn that when you say, I'll be back, I'll be back. And that's because their understanding and perception of time is very different from ours. <laughs> a few verses earlier in our gospel text, Jesus says, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. The same sort of thing that the child feels when the face is covered by the hands or the parent is leaving. We all struggle with the fear of being left at different seasons in our life. As an infant or toddler being left, as a spouse through death, abandonment, betrayal, we have those fears. Later in life, we bid farewell to our parents, and then as we come to the golden years of our life, we bid farewell to our children. There's all these goodbyes. As long as we don't tell Jesus in our lives to get out of our lives, we don't have to worry about him ever leaving us. Because scripture tells us clearly that he never will. <coughs> and we, will even see those loved ones that we bid farewell to in the second coming, in the resurrection of all, we confess at the end of the creeds. Nevertheless, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. We very often tell God, you know, God, I really like things the way they are. Could you please just not have any changes in my life? Kind of like that toddler holding on to the leg of the parent. No, don't go. I will love you and my neighbor on my own terms. Thank you very much. I don't need any guidance on that. I'll make up my own rules. I don't like God's rules, so I'll just ignore them. Instead of loving my neighbor, how about if I love me first? It works for me. I know what God's word says, but you know, I'm a little more enlightened and sophisticated than you are. If God's word and that preacher of yours tells you about one man, one woman marriage, I'll just roll my eyes and explain away your words. Dismiss them as unenlightened I can even accuse you of hate speech and bigotry. Why not? Everyone else seems to agree with me. This is a democracy, of course. We get to decide as a society what's right and wrong. And 
Don't go trying to tell me what my gender is or what bathroom I have to use, thank you. I'll decide that on my own. Now, I'm not talking just about those people out there, although it's easy for us to do such things. I, too, spent the first 40 years of my life sitting where you are every Sunday. And I heard pastors say things that made me roll my eyes. The old Adam in us does that. I know. I sat there and did the same thing and said to myself, well, that one doesn't really apply to me. I mean, I'm good with God on that one. I hope some of these sinners in here are listening to him. With myself, I'll just disagree with some of those little things there. And all the while knowing that I had no intention of standing for that particular truth because it wasn't very popular. The old Adam continues. If God's word and that preacher of yours says life is intrinsically valuable from its very beginning at conception to its very end, I'll just roll my eyes and explain away your word, dismiss it as unenlightened, and your preacher, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I can even accuse you of male chauvinism or misogyny, a fancy word for hating women. Why not? Everyone agrees with me. It is 2016, of course. Get with the times. If God's word and your preacher says it's wrong to go habitate, it's wrong to cheat on your taxes, it's wrong to do or think anything that I want to think or do, or the people that I know and love in my life, the things that they want to do, if I'm okay with it, then God should be okay with it. then I can just quietly nod my head and smile. Calling those around me judgmental hypocrites because I know better. If God's word and that preacher of yours says anything that disagrees with my perception, my neo-Darwinian, old universe, purposeless scientific worldview, with all my enlightened progressive insights, if I can't explain it clearly to my satisfaction, don't expect me to give an amen to that one. Sadly, many see God's word and his commandments, you've heard me say it before, as sort of a buffet table. I'll take some of that feels good grace over there, a little guiltless ditto disobedience over here on the side. I think I'll pass on that Ten Commandments stew, and that side dish of sin and punishment, those don't agree with my system. And whatever happened to the dish, you know, the, the women's ordination, and where, where's that gay, that gay marriage plate? Where'd that go? You see, just like the apostles who didn't understand everything, when Jesus was speaking to them in our gospel, God's infinite and we are finite. We can't make the connections. God tells us everything that we need to know, not everything that we want to know. It pleases him to leave some things a mystery for us. And he does so for our benefit, whether or not we like it. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. We are on the open hand side of that peekaboo thing. The little wiles that are mentioned in this text have all come to pass. The joyous reunion between the toddler and the parent, the joyous reunion between Christ and his apostles. We wait only for that final reveal, that final peekaboo. 
when the dead are raised. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So what is this that he declares? It is the righteousness and holiness that he had and lived out and continues to be in and purchased for the purpose of giving it to us on the cross so that he could declare it to you. I'm going to him who sent me and none who asked me, where are you going? He is going to prepare a place for you that mansion with many rooms that he speaks of, so that where he is you may be also. Time is a funny thing. I was silent for maybe three to four seconds there. And you may have even thought, oh good, he's almost done. <laughs> the gift from God, it's part of his creation. And we experience it differently at different times in our lives, as I mentioned earlier. For a second there, as I said, you may have thought the sermon was almost over. Sorry, a little while longer. Sometimes time passes quickly. Good times, vacation, party weekends. Other times it passes very slowly for us. Work, school, pain, grief, suffering. That long last second before the hands come apart for the peekaboo. Fear and excitement do funny things to how we experience time. You've probably heard before people who say that when they were in that accident, it seemed as everything shifted into slow motion. Time gives us seasons and years and times in our life. As a toddler, we have no concept of time really. That is why we cry when mommy and daddy leave us. There is no later in your world when you're a toddler. There's only the now. In our school years, it seems that time is always against us. School is too long and too boring. The holidays are too, long, too short. And they take too long to get there. It's always bedtime when I'm not tired. Recess is short, summer is short, time's not on your side when you're a child. As young adults, we scramble. We scramble to make our way in the world. And it seems that we never seem to have enough time to get the things done that we think we need to get done. <clears throat> then we get to the middle years of our lives and we realize that in our youth we had a lot of time. We just squandered it sometimes. And all that time now that we have seems to belong to everybody else. We get in our golden years and we realize that they may not be as golden as we'd hoped. And we wonder, where did all the time go? As we try to manage our busy lives, we seem to be low on time. We, it always seems to race between, you remember the race, between the tortoise and the hare? Who won that one? Not the one that was going fast, the one that was persistent and stuck with it. Time is a precious gift from God, and we should not squander it. One remedy for time wasted is, of course, time well spent. Time working, learning, growing. Time with family, friends, and neighbors. Time spent building things, building minds, building relationships. These remedies are very good to wasted time. Lack of something important, maybe. The one thing these remedies fall short on is the peace that surpasses all understanding. You can make good use of your time, but if you don't have access to the peace that surpasses all understanding, even those benefits will eventually rust and decay. Self-help remedies, while helpful, do not comfort us when we struggle with the fear of abandonment. In essence, our lifelong separation anxiety 
fear of separation from our life and from God himself. Are we there yet? You've heard the question. Maybe asked it, but definitely you've probably answered it. How long? In the women's Bible study, which started in Genesis in the fall of 2009, we're in Matthew now, and uh, at the rate we're going, we'll probably be done around next year, maybe late next year, sometime in 2018. This past Friday, we only got through 30 verses of Matthew chapter 5. One might ask, in the words of Psalm 13, How long, O Lord? That question, how long, appears 62 times in Scripture. And in every case, it's a lament. How long, asked men, lamenting in pain and suffering and injustice. How long, ask God, lamenting, how long will I put up with man's sinful nature? How long must we wait for a savior? How long? And you may be asking, I'm sure by now, pastor, how long before this sermon comes to an end? <laughs> Jesus answers that question in a little while. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, in a little while, you will see me. Two little whiles. So, how long is that? We get fixated on time often, so we want to know, what are those little whiles? Here we don't need to figure it, guess it, because it's right there for us in Scripture. It tells us what this little while is. The answer is clear. The apostles were puzzled. What is this that he says to us? Jesus knew that they wanted to know, they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is in this what you are asking yourselves, what I mean by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again in a little while you will see me? The answer to the question, now, before his death and, resur and resurrection, it's a time of sadness, a bit puzzling, to them, but when we hear his explanation and when later the apostles on the, on the resurrection side of the whole sequence saw it all come together, they understood it. It was clear, clear to us and clear to them. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. Good Friday, probably that Saturday as well. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy, Easter morning, clearly. When a woman is giving birth, she is in sorrow because her hour has come. <coughs> but when she has delivered the baby, she is no longer remem re remembering her anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. The little while from Good Friday to Easter, those three days, a lot is processed in this gospel text for that sequence. So while we may know what that little while is, a little while till what? A short time of pain that precedes a time of great joy. Just like the birth of a child, just like the resurrection of our Savior. It is appointed for a man once to die. And die the Son of Man did, but he did not deserve death. He endured it for us. And in essence, our Easter Sunday we get that peekaboo. Like a toddler reunited with its parents. Like a church reunited with her Savior. It is said that time heals all wounds, but in a little while, between Good Friday and Easter, by his wounds we were healed. And no one will take your joy from you. In Jesus' name, amen.